Thank you, Kathy and Social Justice Committee. And I want to thank the Unitarian Church for having us come. We're just delighted to be here. And I'm also very honored to be able to introduce to you Chairman O'Malley Ishitawa in just a few minutes, an incredible leader of the struggle for the liberation of Africa and African people everywhere, including right here in St. Louis. And I, I just, I, you know, I really appreciate that the Unitarian Church is allowing us to, to present this Black Power Blueprint and the struggle of, for building economic and political programs in the hands of the African working class in the most impoverished neighborhood of North St. Louis. And, you know, it's very powerful. And what the Uhuru Movement, the African People's Socialist Party, and Black Power Blueprint are doing is something that the city cannot do and has not done. It is, it is something that comes from the ground up that empowers the community, involves the community, and brings in resources for development, not gentrification or developers. It is for the community itself. And that is, is very, very unique. And I, I salute uh, Chairman O'Malley Chatella for his vision for that. And I want to begin by saying Uhuru. Uhuru. Uhuru means freedom in Swahili. And it is a rallying cry of the movement for African freedom because as Chairman O'Malley Shatella says, that freedom is on the hand, it should be on the minds of African people every day. And I believe that everybody in this room also believes that as well. My name is Penny Hess and I am the chair of the African People's Solidarity Committee. And Jesse Neville here is the chair of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. And the African People's Solidarity Committee is the white organization that was formed by Chairman O'Malley Shatella and the African People's Socialist Party to create a strategic force of white people behind enemy lines, so to speak, to go back into the white community, not in a stance of, of charity or, or um, you know, anything like that, but as a stand of uniting with the right of African people to fight for their liberation and to bring that question into the white community and to raise reparations in a real way. And I, I salute you. I know the question of reparations, which I feel is the most important question in this country and in the world today, because if we don't get to that and why a system built on the enslavement of African people and the genocide of indigenous people, if that, if, if that is not dealt with, through the power of the people, we will never have any ch meaningful change in this country and in the world. And I think I appreciate the Unitarian Church because I know that the question of reparations is something that many of the churches have adopted and that this is a discussion, apparently, you know, very important dynamic discussion in, uh, you know, in the church. So I wanted to show you a few pictures very briefly of the Black Power Blueprint of what's going on in the O'Fallon neighborhood in, um, in on West Florissant in North St. Louis. Okay, so I guess I just click here. This is the Uhuru House. And this, and, and I, I wanna salute Deputy Chair Ona Zanea Shatella, who is the coordinator and the developer of the Black Power Blueprint program as a member, also the deputy chair of the African People's Socialist Party, just the dynamic, incredible force who has just, you know, very, in a very dynamic way created and built these institutions. So this is the Uhuru House. This was a condemned building and with the support of the community uh, and raising resources for reparations from the solidarity movement and um, African contractors, just the community coming together, this was renovated, I believe in 2018. Uh, this is the One Africa, One Nation Farmers Market, which began last year. And, um, you know, it's just very important. It's right there on, the, on Alice Street next door to the, to the Uhuru House. This is the Gary Brooks Community Garden, and this is Mr. Gary Brooks who played a key role in creating that. And, you know, if you ever have a chance 
to come by, to drive by or come on a tour that you can request of the, uh, of the Black Power Blueprint programs. It's very beautiful to see this garden. There is an event stage and there is a giant red, black and green flag, which is the flag of African liberation. And this is a group of volunteers at the garden a couple of weeks ago and the beautiful, beautiful mural that's been painted on the wall uh, bordering the garden. And this is the Black Power Blueprint, the Black Power Vanguard's basketball court, a community basketball court in this, in this neighborhood that just got completed and also has a very beautiful mural that goes with that as well. This is the housing that has been renovated for the African Independence Workforce Program for people who are coming out of this colonial prison system and will be trained in, in job and, and skill training throughout the various fronts of the Uhuru movement. This is some of the, of the apartments from, from, the, uh, from the building. Also being worked on right now is the Uhuru Wakalia African Women's Health Center that is gonna be built also on the same strip of West Florissant. And the African Doula Project which is just getting started, but has already trained 14 women from the neighborhood of North St. Louis to become doulas. Very exciting. This is the Uhuru Jiko Community Commercial Kitchen, which is not too far from here on Goodfellow. And it's going to, it's, it's being renovated right now. It's gonna have a community kitchen. Um, the Uhuru Foods and Pies National, um, national baking facility, as well as a cafe and other kinds of, of programs going on there. And this is the Uhuru Solidarity Center that we participate in, that we work out of. It is a building owned by the Black Power Blueprint. It's a 2654 Gravoy and very, um, very great to be there. We have, we have a big banner that says unity through reparations and just an outpouring of support right there in the Fox Park neighborhood and Benton Park West. So I just want to, to say that it is my honor to introduce Chairman Omalia Shatella, the revolutionary leader whose vision and theoretical worldview means achieving African liberation in his lifetime. He has dedicated his life to providing the science and organization necessary to build a global movement of African workers to unite and liberate their motherland of Africa and win. That African people are one people all around the world. So the chairman created the African People's Socialist Party and he united theory and practice to liberate Africa and Africa's resources from the grip of colonialism based on the understandings of African internationalism. The chairman built the mass movement for reparations, very exciting because he rang in the World Tribunal on Reparations to African People in Brooklyn, New York in 1982 with the determination to make reparations a household word in the United States, which indeed it is, as we know. Um, the chairman has taken the movement beyond protest in creating over 50 institutions as the infrastructure for a liberated African workers economy. The chairman is the author of many books, including his most recent book, um, the report to the seventh Congress, which is called Vanguard, probably have that in the back. And he is the founder and leader of the Uhuru movement, which by the way, is not just in St. Louis, but all throughout the United States, the Caribbean, Europe, and in Africa. Um, and he provides the leadership for the world anti-colonial revolutionary struggle, the chairman of the African People's Socialist Party and the African Socialist International. And I also wanna say happy birthday, chairman. It is his birthday today. So Uhuru and welcome Chairman Omali Satella. Uhuru, do I have to reduce the height a bit? Yeah. I'd like, first of all, to express my appreciation to Comrade Penny Hess uh, for the introduction to give a special shout out to Kathy 
uh, who we knew before we got here, uh, thanks to Jessie Neville, who's sitting here and talked so glowingly about her. <laughs> A special appreciation to Pastor Kim, uh, to the Unitarian Church uh, for hosting this discussion on today. I think it's an extraordinarily important discussion that we're having. The whole issue of reparations is incredibly significant. It has always been, but it has achieved much more uh, gravity and significant in the passing few years. Um, as a child, I was trapped with the horrible situation of trying to understand this world that we live in. I was able to read um, while still a toddler. Wasn't able, wasn't something that was just dropped on me, but I was fortunate to have my mother's sister who taught me to read. And I learned to read uh, not through the childish books that one gets in what they now call pre kindergarten or kindergarten, uh, but the newspaper. That's what my aunt taught me how to read through the newspaper. <laughs> but one of the things that struck me uh, forever as a child is that every place that I looked, every book I read, every newspaper article, uh, every movie that I saw uh, depicted black people, people who looked like me, uh, living in dire, severe poverty, uh, almost states of what would be characterized as savagery, violence and ignorance imposed on our lives. This was a very visible and visceral uh, thing that uh, I had to confront as a child on the one hand. On the other hand, when I looked at, at pictures and images of white people, it was this big difference of, of, of obvious wealth, uh, uh, resources, accessibility. Um, it was glaring and I had to understand why. What was it? What, what was this difference? Why was it? And everything that I was taught at that time, and there are iterations of the same lessons today, uh, told me that this great difference in the conditions of existence of black people and white people uh, was due to the fact that white people were more civilized, swiftier than Africans and what have you. And that's why we were impoverished. And that's why white people were not impoverished and lived so much better, uh, sometimes in the same cities that we lived in and whatever parts of the world, that was the reality that we were confronted with. And this was a heck of a burden to live with, uh, not just for me, but for the millions and millions of black people, people who look like me, who were getting the same lessons, being taught the same things around the world, that this, this tremendous poverty and violence that imposed on our lives all the time had to do uh, with, uh, with uh, a, a deficit in civilization and thriftiness. And uh, so I had to search to come up with a better understanding. That was not a good understanding. That was a demoralizing, crippling uh, uh, understanding, intellectually crippling, uh, morally crippling. And then so through uh, an investigation and a determination to change this reality. And these ideas that I'm talking about did not exist separate from the actual conditions, the political power uh, that as a child uh, made it necessary for me uh, to live in uh, uh, an area of two square mile area uh, in the small city in Florida that I was, I, I was born in and grew up with that was uh, relegated for black people whose function in that city was, uh, who were brought to that city uh, and uh, that was primarily a swamp area before, uh, the credit swamps, and uh, uh, who function as cheap labor uh, for uh, the tourism, the tourist industry that would eventually come 
after we cleared the, the city, after we paved the streets and did all of that work and still relegated to that two square mile area that black people had to live in. And then the police were there in order to maintain uh, that relationship to make sure nothing changed. And we were to be the forces that uh, would eventually uh, be there to work in the tourist industry. We were the ones who cleaned the hotels, built the hotels, cleaned the hotels, kept them clean and things like that uh, for tourists who were coming from the north, coming from Canada and other places to live in this city, which was, it was, all, it was like, a, it was a beach city. It was a, a tourist mecca for white people. And then uh, because it was such a nice place uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, weather, uh, it became a place that uh, people who came to tour uh, would bring their parents and leave them there in nursing homes. In fact, uh, there were so many old white people there, Johnny Carson, some of you uh, perhaps old enough to remember this television personality, uh, jokingly referred to St. Petersburg, Florida as God's waiting room, right? <laughs> so the African population would become the cheap labor to take care of white people who were left by uh, their children uh, in God's waiting room. And I don't know if God was there, but black people were there taking out the, the bedpans and doing all the other kinds of work to take care of them. This, is, this was the reality that I lived in and venturing out of that two square mile area was, uh, was dangerous. I mean, I've, I've, I had to, if I were going to go to what was now referred to as the beach uh, in St. Petersburg, Florida, I had to walk through uh, uh, the white community to get there. And it was not unusual to be stopped by white men and threatened uh, for our lives. I mean, it, it was so, so normal that you just expected it. This is how we grew up having to deal with it. Uh, it was an extraordinary thing. So that's, that's, that, that was, and this, so you had this police organization that was there to protect this relationship, to make sure that Africans maintained uh, our location and, and were there to carry out our mission uh, uh, as an economic force uh, to bring profit and value uh, to white people who control everything there. That's what I grew up with. And then it, it was easy for me to understand later on and struggling uh, to come to terms with this relationship uh, that uh, these extraordinary discovery that uh, just between, because we were told that that we came to know white people uh, because of uh, white people were very beneficent. It was, it was uh, as Rudyard Kipling has said, taking up the white man's burden came to bring civilization to us uh, that we would not have had otherwise. And wealth and resources, and then Tarzan movies with the white guy, the white uh, child uh, who swept ashore as a baby on the continent of Africa and is rescued uh, by, by apes, big monkeys and who would grow up uh, to take over all of Africa, to take over the monkeys and, and, and the people, et cetera. This is what I grew up with. What an extraordinary statement. This is being pumped day in and day out throughout the processes, our churches and, and, and every other institution that was there was promoting this understanding of reality. Um, you know, even the notion that, you know, we were born cursed and things like this. The churches were teaching us this. This was, this was what the philosophy that was stemming from this particular economic relationship that uh, came about as a consequence of, of black people being taken into captivity. And I say this because the reality is that you come to understand that just the, the four short years 1314, 1347, 1351, that half the white people on earth died. In four years, a plague. There was no, there was no wealth uh, that was there to be shared, to be taken out uh, on Rudyard Kipling's mission. 
There was no white man's burden that was being assumed to go to the jungles and dark places in Africa and the rest of the world. There was poverty and disease. And then the white people, I came to understand, lived under feudalism, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which uh, was uh, a, a state of uh, oppression uh, with no freedoms at all for well, a thousand years. This was the reality. And yet they pump out this nonsense to me that I came to know white people because white people were so, so beneficent. And they had all this civilization and Christianity. They, had, they, they, they wanted to share with the rest of us, etc. And of course, that was not the case. And the case is that a whole political economy that dominates the world today came into existence through colonialism. When Portugal in 1415 set out, Portugal, tiny at the time, insignificant Portugal, barely attached to the rest of Europe, Portugal set out in 1415 and began the process of enslaving Africans in Africa and, and that, uh, that became the process that connected and created what we now know as Europe, which before then did not exist. Even in the imagination of white people, the people who we now refer to as Europe define themselves primarily in relationship to each other as warring tribes and things like that on this, on this territory. So it was Celts and Normans and Saxons and what have you. The thing that brought them into oneness, a sense of oneness, a sense of sameness that people refer to as nations was the slave trade. This is the thing that began to bring resources and the whole of what we now know as Europe got involved in this process and colonialism. And from this grew this magnificent political economy that, that, that shakily dominates the world right now. That's where it came from. And the reality is that, that every society uh, is, is a consequence of an economic base of that society and a superstructure that stems from it and explains it. And by superstructure, what I'm talking about is the belief systems. It's, it's even religion and culture and things like this. The, you don't have to look far uh, to understand why you will find niggers and, and darkies and all of this in various places of the European world because the whole economy of Europe came from that reality. And the status that I tried to understand as a child, my poverty, the poverty of people who look like me and the wealth and resources of the white world is explained by that reality. That is something that you don't have to make it up. You can go even to your libraries and look it up. And once we come to terms with how to understand what it is that we're looking at, it becomes clear. I'm just saying this because I think it's extremely important, especially when we talk about reparations, because if we don't talk about this, then we end up seeing reparations as simply and only something that beneficent white people can do uh, for their darker brothers and sisters who might live in the same neighborhood or some other place. It's the same kind of thing of send a few dollars, or a few pennies uh, every week and adopt your little uh, starving child uh, in Africa kind of situation. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about rectifying a relationship here. Rectifying a relationship. We're saying it doesn't happen to be this way. We do not believe in some kind of, of, of biological predetermination of how people will live and relate to each other. We understand that the whole concept of race uh, is a political construct that was created and, and is often manipulated to serve the interests of those who control this powerful economy that came into existence through slavery and colonialism. We hate that system. All decent people on the planet Earth hate systems 
that have their origin and their logic in the existence of slaves and slave masters and workers and bosses. We hate that system. And for most of my life, I have fought against that system. Just in terms of who I am and why I am before you today. Thanks to Kathy and Pastor Kim and this church. I grew up struggling with this reality. I had to struggle with this reality. I have to struggle with this reality. I turned 81 years old today. And for most of my life, I have had to fight it. It has been no abstraction for me. It's something I have to deal with all my life for almost 100 years of my own existence. This is what I've had to struggle with. And I want to appreciate again your openness uh, for having us to be able to have this discussion because part of what has to happen to even have this discussion is to go against the logic of the superstructure that comes from colonialism, et cetera, the ideas that says that the reason that you have this disparity, starving people in North St. Louis, in the same city that we live in, the reason that this so-called LRA, this land uh, reutilization authority exists as the biggest land owner in St. Louis today as a consequence of taking the properties through taxes and other means of black people who live in this city. If we don't understand this, then we, we say that the reason for this is based on some moral or other deficit in black people. And even those of us who say that we hate but it's characterized as racism, find ourselves trapped by that same logic. No, what I'm saying is that something horrible has happened and does happen to black people here and around the world. My presence here is a consequence of an attack on Africa. It's not like 400 years ago, some black people got together and said, you know what, I think they're gonna create a basketball league in, in America, let's get a jump on it and leave early uh, so that we can, get opening, no, 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 no. And you know, the, I'm here today because in 1884 and 85, a decision was made in Berlin, Germany by Europeans that carved up Africa and to, in these, to these in, untenable entities that are referred to as countries. And this was done in order to prevent Europeans from fighting each other, going to war with each other over who was going to get what part of our Africa. This was called the Berlin Conference. Not a single African there. These are determinations made over our heads. The political economy that relegated me to a status of poverty, despair, humiliation, it's something that was created over our heads. We had nothing to do with it. But it's locked us into this parasitic relationship. And so it's really important to be having this discussion with you because what I'm saying is I want you to join this process against for reparations because it's a process against colonialism. I'm an outlier in the party and the Uhuru movement in this perspective because there are a lot of people who now talk about reparations who weren't talking about it before. When we first started reparation work, we were considered a lunatic fringe. That's insane to talk about reparations. And the basis of the lunacy was the, the certainty that white people would never, never, ever give up the resources that has come and that, that do come as a consequence of the subjugation of black people. And I said, that's not true. That white people are people, regardless of the behavior that we see and that sometimes get defined as inhumane. That white people have to have an, 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 an ability to come into contact with their own humanity. And you can't come into contact with your own humanity separated from the vast majority of the human family. You can't do that. There's not enough NATO, not enough bombs or anything to keep that reality. You wanna be a part of the human family. That's the call that's being made today. Reparations make that call. 
not some charity, not something that you give to your butler every Christmas or your, your person who picks up your garbage. No, join this magnificent struggle that's being led by the oppressed of the world to change this world. That's the call when we say reparation. And so in 1982, we built the first, and I'm saying this because reparations is talked about all the time today. And like struggles of the oppressed, once it becomes inevitable that these struggles have achieved traction, then every opportunist and every force that against the struggle joins it in order to lead it into a different direction. Reparations is talked about today. We ran uh, people for Justin Neville here. We lived in St. Petersburg, Florida, only 20% African population. He was a part of, of two candidates that we ran for local office. Akile Anayi, young woman, who I think may have been 21 at the time, 2017, uh, ran on the slogan, make, Saint, make South St. Petersburg white again. And so they said, your race is in reverse. No, we repo people. We want to repossess the land that's just recently been stripped from us and being stripped from us every day of our lives. And Jesse ran on the slogan, unity through reparations. That's a dynamic demand. It's not just, we shall overcome. It's taking a stance, unity through reparations. Che Guevara once said that solidarity should be considered. It's not just a matter of well-wishing, it's sharing the same fate, whether in victory or in death. Unity through reparations, unity through joining the struggle to overturn this relationship that exists in the world today. And that is exemplified by the relationship that you see in your, in your city right now. Unity through reparations, that's what the man. So we have begun this process of constructing Black Power Blueprint is one of the things that we're talking about. You see it. If you go through West Florissant, if you come to West Oakland and you see this dynamic situation of development that's right before your eyes in just a few short years, what we have accomplished. We call this a project, process of dual power, creating dual power projects. They like to reference uh, the situation in North St. Louis. Uh, as a consequence of uh, some kind of food desert. We say it's not a food desert, it's a power desert. Because if we had the power over our own lives, we'd do many times over what you can see happening now in North St. Louis as a consequence of the black power blueprint. So our children can walk down the street and see clean streets, see basketball courts, see, see uh, uh, markets that have been created. You don't have to leave your community and drive for 20 minutes to find a fresh vegetable that's right there in your community. Where your parents, their parents can uh, expect to be able to sell uh, their products, their produce there, produce there, and then and buy from each other. So there becomes another dynamic relationship. That's the kind of thing that we create. We talk about a doula where we teach and have taught young African women, African women generally, uh, to, to become doulas. And in a city like St. Louis, that's extraordinarily important because in St. Louis, there are enough black babies dying in their first year of life to fill 15 kindergarten classes every year. This is a power deficit, not, not some, some, some other kind of desert. There would be food if we had the power. There would be clinics if we have the power. That's what we're building right now with the Black Power Blueprint. And our power is a power that negates the power of the colonizer. That's why we call it dual power. That's why we say join in this struggle for reparations. That's why we say we're not waiting for a government to offer reparations. Biden has come out against it. Obama is cowardly. Uh, opportunist self uh, was opposed to it because he shouldn't bring up things that happened a long time ago because it brings disunity like poverty and despair and police violence 
And all these things don't constitute the most uh, significant element of disunity that we find in this city, in this country. So I want to say that, and finally, I just want to say that we have created something, more than 50 different economic development uh, projects. And the objective, again, is to capture control of our own lives. Because the people that cannot feed, clothe, and house itself cannot be free. There's no such thing as freedom under those circumstances. That's why there's so much war happening today. That's why there's permanent warfare, it seems. Like every place you look, war, war, war. These are poor people who are trying to disengage from this parasitic relationship they have with the colonial powers. And I cannot sit down without uh, saying something about the significance of the existence of the solidarity movement. These are white people who were quite ordinary and uh, who broke from the ranks, who provided leadership, vanguards, if you will, and uh, stepped forward uh, to unite uh, with uh, other people to rectify this relationship, to reclaim their place in humanity. I have to say something about that. Comrade Penny Hess, I've worked with uh, 40 some odd years now, and um, who took such a courageous stance and has been a powerful force going into the white community. You know, every time somebody, uh, white leftist, uh, gets born, the first thing they want to do is come to the black community. They sort of like missionaries. And, uh, but to be in the white community talking about black power, that's gutsy. That's gutsy. And so, I mean, she had the ability to take that stance and these incredible forces that she surrounded herself with and who she's trained and created. And then, of course, I must, 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 if we're talking about reparations, if we're talking about dual power, if we're talking about black power blueprint, acknowledge uh, uh, Ona Zenea Shetela. She is my wife, but I hope you don't hold that against her. Um, some people do. Uh, they try to discredit uh, her genius, her creativity, someone who has brought uh, more science and uh, uh, capacity to this whole question of economic development and, uh, than anybody in the history of our movement and the history of, of most movements I've seen. That's only Zanea Shetela. I want to thank you again, and I want to uh, just uh, restate the chant that comes from uh, the Solidarity Movement, uh, unity through reparations, Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman, that was so powerful and moving, and I just, I've heard you speak many times. I'm very deeply moved by that presentation, and I just want to express my unity with the, the whole question and struggle for power in the hands of the African community, the understanding of colonialism as the political and economic power that dominates and extracts and steals the resources of African people and the ability of white people to have a principled stand of reparations to African people. So thank you very much for that. I would like to open it up for questions and discussion and the chairman can come back up. I did wanna say that in the back, we have these very recently produced um, new updated brochures about the Black Power Blueprint. And also, if you would like to, if you would like to contribute reparations or get involved, you can go to blackpowerblueprint.org, and it just tells the whole story, has all of the information and updating and how much money has been raised in reparations in every other way. And then I do want to encourage everybody to look at 
Next Saturday will be the National March for Reparations to African People right here, starting out at the library just down the street from Tower Grove Park, but you can get all the information and I hope you'll sign up and, and join that. So I would like to see if there are any, any questions or discussion. Yes. Oh, great. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. How's that work? Uh, thank you for coming. It was a very good talk. But I want to ask you some questions. Um, me, I, I grew up in West African villages. Uh, my leader, he was from uh, Africa, he was growing up. And, and I was socialized into Mandy culture. I do have African ancestry but you can't see it on my face. Um, I spent many, many years in those villages. And I'd like to know, would I be welcome in your organization? As an obviously white person, but complex. I, I support your goals. I would like to sit down and discuss sometime with you about many topics, but would I, or is, your organization is separatist. Well, at the moment, someone would talk about 1776, uh, represent a declaration of separation. Um, then I would accept that term. I believe in independence for Africa and African people, total, absolutely unequivocal independence. Africa and African people having power over our own lives. I believe in that. Uh, this whole concept of, of separatism is a narcissistic uh, statement that comes from white people who see uh, black people who are locked into this death grip of colonialism uh, in some kind of subjective fashion that they don't like white people. They don't want to be with white people. I want to be free. And being free means being independent, being able to have our own choices economically and politically. That's what I'm fighting for. It has nothing to do with the fact that somebody's white. White people created whiteness. There was no such concept as whiteness before uh, uh, racial colonialism. That's where it came from. But it's something that we live with in terms of it's a factor that affects every aspect of our lives. For example, there are people who I know good people, men and women, Africans, uh, who, Africans and, and white people who may be in love with each other and want to have love affairs and be married, etc. It's not something I would promote. Not because I don't think people should be free, but because it feeds into the extraordinary obscene logic that, that black pe whiteness is beautiful that it's a rejection of blackness. That's the logic that, that it feeds into, that everything white is beautiful while everything black is, is just the opposite. It's a logic that, that we cannot escape easily. The way we break free from this, it seems to me, is the, uh, by the ability of white people uh, who, when you say that you have African ancestry, everybody does, you know, so that's not a profound statement even though uh, you lived in African villages and I didn't, right? Uh, but the, the, the thing is that what has to happen is, like me, join uh, the struggle of African people for, against colonialism. Even from the location you are now, you're much more effective in some ways in struggling against colonialism where you are. I mean, uh, I've known so many people who, I feel very close to who white people grow dreadlocks, sing reggae, uh, and even take anti, you know, unlearning racism courses. It doesn't change a thing in the world. What changes a thing in the world is an assault on a system that reproduces itself through ideas as well as otherwise. And so the biggest thing that you do when you take a stance is to take a stance in solidarity with the struggle for black power. And you can do that. 
from where you are without coming into this organization. She has done that. She is an African internationalist. I am closer to her than to most African people who I know. She is not in the African People's Socialist Party, but she stands and comes and talks to Kathy and all the Cathys of the world saying that this is the stance that we should take. She becomes a vanguard in that sector. It makes it impossible. We take away all the political space from our enemies so they cannot use this concept of race as a means of attacking us and things like that. Somebody, we've been attacked recently. I'm attacked all the time. Are we so stupid as black people that, you know, I participated in SNCC. I participated in organizing black people to vote in the South, life-threatening situations. And, uh, and when we were doing that, it was stated that we were sent there uh, by the communists, by the Russians and stuff like this, because black people are too stupid to fight for ourselves, to have uh, ideas of our own, and even today, to take such a stance uh, is a serious thing because you're talking about not unlearning your racism. We're talking about we're talking about this. We're talking about destroying a system that is based on parasitism. That relationship has to be destroyed. I think you're doing magnificent right now, being here in this committee with this church and what have you, uh, and probably one of the reasons that I'm able to be here today. The work that you do and probably is affected by the fact that you lived in West African villages and had the benefit of Mandingo culture uh, and things like that, that I did, by the way. Uhuru. Uhuru. I want to say, listen, may I say this? So that we can be clear on, hopefully, uh, I was in Belfast, Ireland in 1983. This is the time of the so-called troubles. When, when Ireland at the time was an undisguised colony of England. It's the first time in my life that I ever saw white people who lived in circumstances close to what black people lived in the United States. I was there. And it was a remarkable engagement. Uh, they were colonized and still are, as quiet as it's kept. Uh, and, uh, and as a consequence of this relationship, I was with the Irish Republican Socialist Party. They had a press conference where they announced to the world at that press conference that they would, first of all, that they supported the reparations demand, that they supported uh, the demand that we were making that to get countries and people to push the United States to ratify the United Nations Convention on, on prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide. They, they, they said they would participate in that. And they also said that they would not take any money, any resources from Irish persons in the United States who were opposed to the struggle of black people in reparations. What an extraordinary statement they made. This was solidarity and unity. And within days after I left, the British burned their, off, their headquarters down because they don't want that kind of relationship. Nobody wants that kind of relationship. They want to keep us all isolated and separated from each other. Or if we're connected to each other in some, some abstract way that doesn't change anything, that my mission has to be to feed the narcissism uh, of white people to be engaged in making you like me, uh, fighting against racism, please like me. This is extraordinary. Of course, if I throw a brick at you, you won't like me, right? I can't fight back, you won't like me. But this discussion, I think, uh, uh, is helpful. I organized the first uh, rally in California in solidarity with the Salvadoran Revolution. I did that. And uh, uh, with the Nicaraguans, I did that. I was there in Nicaragua uh, uh, with the people from Nicaragua. I was one of, I attended the, in the, the Green Party in, in Germany when it went into the parliament mistake, but please don't hold that against me. Uh, 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 my point is that our movement is international and I can support 
I had never met a Nicaraguan when we held that first, I had never met a Nicaraguan, didn't have to meet one. Didn't have to have the Nicaraguan say, I'll support you if you support me. Didn't matter because I knew that the success in Nicaragua would be a, my success because it's a success against colonialism. I traveled to France and spoke to people there. All around the world, I've done that, recognizing that's a common struggle and not trying to impose any conditions on my ability to unite with them because it was righteous. It was just struggle. And that's what we have to do. That's what this church is doing. That's what Kathy told me before I got here. Well, I'm lying in the church, Kathy. <laughs> that's what she was thinking. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. Unity through? Reparation. All right. Uhuru. Any other, yeah, any other questions? Let's say 20 years ago from now, we made some uh, progress on this. What would you like to see, the, uh, progress would you like to see? 20 years from now? That's an uh, interesting question because the, just in part because I, I think that uh, this, uh, political economy is experiencing an existential crisis. I think that's obvious. Everything is threatened by it. You know, the environment, everything, everything is threatened right now by it. Uh, I think that the people have to come to power. I think African people have to have absolute co complete control of our own lives. That gives us the ability to enter into relationships as equals with anybody else in the world, you see? Uh, so uh, even before we can talk about some things, some things have to occur so that we can stand and sit as equals, you know, uh, in this relationship. So that has to happen. And I think that what has to happen is that uh, we continue to uh, minimize the, the, um, the effectiveness, the capacity of a system uh, that's born on parasitism. Uh, that, that means not just for African people, but the whole world economy. We live, we live in a world right now where something like 80% of the people on the planet are trying to survive of uh, something like 12 US dollars a day. 80% of the people, 50% of the people on the planet Earth are trying to survive or $2.50 or less a day. And if you're in Africa, most of the people who are living off $1 a day in the world are on the continent of Africa, the richest continent on planet Earth. This is where uh, the big contradiction clearly is roiling right now. It's about to explode uh, with China and Russia and the United States and other forces contending for the wealth of, of, of Africa. Because the reality is there's not a modern economy in the world that could uh, survive without the resources that come from Africa. That's just an objective truth. So uh, Africa has to be free. The colonial peoples of the world, the majority of the people have to be free in control of our own resources. That opens the door for decent and honest kinds of uh, relationships without coercion. That's, that's what I would see. And uh, that means things like ending the blockade on Cuba. That means something like ending the, the sanctions uh, on even Afghanistan, who are being starved to death after they beat the United States on the battlefield, now they starve them to death. Uh, uh, it means that the peoples have to be free and to make their own choices, make their own choices, uh, uncoerced choices, no Marines in the background, no FBI agents uh, with flashbang grenades and the rest of that pre-dawn. People should be free. That's what the struggle is all about. And so to make that concrete, as opposed to just an abstract concept, concept that means that people have to have control of their own political economy. And so Africa must have control of African resources. You can shout the name of Steve Jobs to the heavens, but millions of African people died to get that coal tan from mines with children and what have you that made Apple possible. This is what they're fighting for, to maintain that, uh, et cetera. So just for Africa to be free, united, control of our resources, in, in unity with other peoples around the world. And this is the call, you know, uh, for you. I truly believe that. I truly believe that this is the way, uh, because many people are trying to find a way how to 
how do white people uh, enter into the class struggle? And what we're saying is that the colonial question, that the class struggle globally is concentrated in the colonial question, colonialism. This is the foundation for the entire establishment. It doesn't take much to, to figure that out. Once you think about it, you can see that's obvious. You know. So I, I know that was a kind of roundabout uh, uh, response to what you just uh, raised. Uh, because I can't think of a policy of such, for example, that I'm looking for. But I am looking for uh, people having control of our own resources uh, without coercion being involved in it, uh, without foreign and alien powers uh, trying to make the decisions for us. Uhuru, thank you. As, yes. as resources become increasingly scarce, as it looks like it's going to happen, individuals tend to start focusing on themselves. How do we maintain solidarity in times of perceived scarcity? Two things, it is, I think, I'm glad you said perceived scarcity, because it is perceived scarcity, or scarcity that has been imposed by the political, organ, by the economic organization that has been imposed on people around the world. You have, on the one hand, tremendous amount of resources in Africa. You got coltan, you got cobalt, you got all of this stuff that makes machines work and computers work and cell phones work, et cetera, on the one hand. And then on the other hand, you have a massive unemployment there. You've got uh, situations uh, where what has to happen is that this has to be reconfigured. The, the world is undergoing of an economic and political reconfiguration even as we have this discussion today. What I'm saying is the fight against scarcity is the fight against those who have hoarded the world's resources for themselves and kept them from the people. That's what the reparations demand and Black Power Blueprint is all about. And that's not a simple, it is a simple issue, but it's not a, it's not a simplistic kind of thing. You know, uh, 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 you know, go and buy all the toilet paper that Walmart has available, you know, something like that. You know, what I'm saying is that we have to have the long view because as long as they can keep us locked in short-term vision of the world, then we'll always be just fighting for the immediate situation. We say that there's a greater world that's possible. We, we can latch on to it, and we know the power and capacity of this world based on how it got constructed. We know it's constructed of slavery and colonialism. Therefore, what we do to undermine it is support the struggles against slavery and colonialism. And that's, that's part of how we deconstruct this world of scarcity. Yeah. Uhuru. Thank you very much. So come right here, I was telling him earlier, he's wearing the colors of the Sandinistas <laughs> <laughs> in Nicaragua, and also the comrades from Chile. That's right. Uh, yeah, Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman. You. You so just really want to thank you. That was. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Kathy. Thank you, Social thank Justice you. Committee and the Unitarian Church. Thank you so much. I'm glad all of you were able to hear that. Um, presentation, and uh, I hope that's a lot of food for thought for everyone, and I appreciate everybody's attendance. Thank you. <laughs>